morning and welcome to The Point. Whether you're joining us online or worshiping with us right here in the room, we are excited that you are here. We're looking forward to another great day together and we are praying for each and every person here to encounter Jesus in a new and meaningful way. If this is your first time joining us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. As a new guest, we invite you to take out your phone and scan the QR code on the seat in front of you. Or if you're online, you can click the link in the chat. This will direct you to a short form to fill out that simply lets us know that you are here. By doing this, it gives our church staff the opportunity to reach out and say, hello, welcome to The Point. As a mom of three young children, I am thankful to be a part of a church community that values children and young families. As we look ahead to our summer months, there is a lot happening within our ministries for Point Kids and students. One of these opportunities is Summer Jam. Families with children in preschool through fifth grade are invited to join us June 9th through the 11th for three nights full of fun games, awesome music, and learning about Jesus. Dinner will be served each evening, and best of all, it's free. More information and registration can be found online at gotothepoint.com or by scanning the QR code on the half sheet that you received this morning. Make plans to come join us and let's start the party. When you came in this morning, you might have noticed the wall in the lobby covered in orange envelopes. This is the Summer Experience Envelope Wall, and it is an open invitation to donate towards our Point Kids and student summer experiences, such as summer jam, summer camps, and missions trips. Take a look at this video highlighting those summer experiences from last year. I think my favorite part of Summer Jam is just getting to sit alongside William and see something geared directly to him. My favorite night was when we um, saw the ma magician. My favorite part was the ice cream was my favorite. <laughs> I think my favorite moment was probably the kids versus parents. and My favorite too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the family um, game night, that was a fun night. So it was kind of just an evening where you can just get rid of the hustle and bustle and just come and enjoy an evening together. I worked at the Charleston Boys and Girls Club, mostly working as almost like a TA to help with the kids. I worked at the Boys and Girls Club too. When we fed the homeless, like, you could just see how grateful they were and knowing that God is actually there for them and loving them, caring for them, and providing. I went to camp, honestly, to grow my relationship with God because I feel like I drifted off, and so I just wanted to regain and grow further with Him. The one guy said, you're nevertheless always the more, and that really stuck out to me because I feel like I was just learning a lot about like not comparing my journey with God to like other people, and I think one of the big things, He's always there, and like He just wants you to be like who you are. Um, I feel like God really spoke to me during when we went to camp, and I really opened my relationship with Him and got to know Him better, and then just also with everybody, like kids outside of our church, but even with people in our church, I grew my relationship like 10 times more than it was, and it was really great. When you pick up an envelope from the wall and donate the amount shown on the front, your contribution will help make these summer experiences more affordable for our kids and students. Let's rally together this morning and help clear the wall. If you haven't caught on, we are all about partnering with and supporting our families here at The Point. In fact, next Sunday is our Family Experience Sunday. We like to say that it's a day when kids bring their adults to church. Next Sunday, all of our Point Kids spaces will be closed so that we can all be together right here in the worship center. We believe it's important for our kids and our adults to worship and experience Jesus side by side. And Sundays like these give us the opportunity to do just that. We love Sundays when the worship center is bursting with all ages and generations. So be sure that you're here with us. 
All of the ministries here at The Point, including all that happens in our Point Kids and student spaces, would not be possible without the faithful giving and financial support from all of you who call this place home. If you're interested in joining this group of faithful givers, here is a quick reminder of the ways that you can give. Online on the website at gotothepoint.com. Text The Point Give on your mobile device to 888 888- 364-4483. Mail a check to 311 Meyer Street here in Seymour. Or if you're worshiping on site today, you can drop your gift into the black boxes on the back wall as you leave the worship center. Now, let's all stand and worship the King of Kings for all the great things that he has done and will continue to do. Amen. Good morning, Point family. So good to be together to sing this morning. Let's celebrate the greatness of our God.
for the great things he has done. Thank you, Lord. We worship you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your justice, Lord, how you're making all things new. Amen. So in the season of, of the church, it's called Eastertide, and we're celebrating how God has come to make all things new, how he's turning graves into gardens. So let's just worship him and declare that this morning. You came. 
Man, what an incredible time together with Jesus, amen? And I was here during practice, I was telling the team, like a lot of times, I'm just a guy of routine, and I have to have like the things in order for me to feel right about life. <laughs> and I come in on Sunday mornings early, and I listen to the team uh, lead worship, and they practice, and man, God was just moving in my heart already this morning, and I'm just, I, it's incredible to be together. And, and I posted on Facebook that Jesus is here, and I mean it, folks. That's everything about what we're here for today. And if you have not had an encounter with Jesus, like my prayer for you today is if you miss everything, that you would get that one thing, that mystery, the sacred reality of our faith is that Jesus is here and now, not dead and gone. And I'm grateful uh, he is here with me and with all of us together today. You might notice that I'm wearing kind of a weird shirt. I've changed my name from Pastor John to Bob. <laughs> you might have seen some people walking around and thought, why is everybody wearing shirts that say I'm a Bob? Well, I just want to tell you real quick what this is all about. Yesterday, we had another uh, incredible time of worship. Over, I think, 120 of our uh, team members, people who serve here at the point, who do ministry, who love and encourage and all that all throughout the week and year. We came yesterday. We worshiped. We had some training, some time of equipping. It was just an, uh, an amazing time together. And we talked about what it means to be a Bob. So if you're curious what in the world Bob means, Ask somebody with a shirt and see if they can tell you. It will see how good we trained them yesterday. <laughs> if you want a shirt, here's the thing. I want you to sign up to serve today. Not only do you get an amazing shirt that says you're a Bob, but you also get donuts once a year as we come together. If there's not a better reason than to get a free T-shirt and donuts, I don't know what they're, what is. Like it's, it's an amazing thing. We had an awesome time at Point Leadership Institute. We'd love for you. Open up your app today. Find a place to serve. God, and here's the other reason you should serve. Can I just tell you that before I jump into my sermon? This is sermon part one, right? It's because God made you to be a part of his body. And here's the truth of it. We are not who, in fullness who God has created us to be without all of us joining together. And each one of you are, are significant. And God has amazing plans for you to be a part of what he's doing in the world. Amen? Amen. Now, well, here we are, uh, this uh, now third week of Jesus sightings. We had Easter last week, Jesus w was showing up, and now this week, Jesus is showing up to some folks on the road to Emmaus. And we've been talking about what does it look like for us as Jesus people to have Easter and resurrection move beyond an hour on a Sunday? To, to live into this amazing reality that God has called us to, to truly be resurrected people. That he wants to bring dead places in your life to life right now today. And that being in relationship with the here and now Jesus isn't just about your forever. It's about your today. And we've been talking about these moments when Jesus showed up. And there, each week is revealed a barrier to our ability to see and experience a life of resurrection. Last week we talked about fear. And what keeps us locked up in rooms and keeps us from being able to see Jesus showing up in rooms. One of my favorite points from last Sunday was there is not a locked door in this entire world that can keep Jesus out. Amen? That was good. If you missed it last week, go watch it. It was really good. I was excited to encounter Jesus. Today, we're going to have another moment of Jesus sighting and encounter some, some people who had a barrier in their life that kept them from seeing that Jesus was showing up in their lives. We're going to jump right in this morning. Here we are uh, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 24, verses 13 through 16. It says this, now that same day, this was all happening in that moment. Jesus raised from the dead, and then he was in the locked rooms. And now on that same day, as all that was going down, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Two people, two disciples of Jesus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each, each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But... What? They were kept from recognizing him. It's an interesting way of phrasing it, but the truth is this was not something that God was doing to them. The language within the scripture points to the reality that, that something inside of them, something inside of their minds was keeping them from recognizing that Jesus was in their midst. Last week we talked about fear. This week we have another instance where people couldn't see. Many of us have issues with this reality. There's times in my life so often where I can't see. And, and the dangerous reality we're going to talk about is even less about the ability of not being able to see, but thinking we, we can see when we really can't. And that was going on in the heart of these men is that they couldn't see, but they thought 
that they could. In this interaction with Jesus, we're going to kind of journey through the story. And I believe we're going to first uncover the barrier that was within their hearts and then start to unpack this barrier and how it keeps you and me from living resurrected lives. So we go on in the story. It says, he asked them, this is Jesus, well, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. It was the first hint at the barrier within their lives. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? That, that's translation, are you an idiot? <laughs> like, can you imagine looking at Jesus? Are you the only person in the entire world who has no clue what was going on here? Jesus asks, what things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, duh, they replied. This is Pastor John's translation. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. I want you to notice those words. If you like taking notes or if you're writing things down, I want you to, to like write those down, like notice them. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. That this story, and I believe that line, but we had hoped, reveals the barrier we're going to talk about today, this barrier of hopelessness in our lives. Last week we talked about how fear keeps us locked in rooms. Today I want to talk about how hopelessness keeps us from seeing the life-changing truth that Jesus is here and now not dead and gone. And it was present in these men. And their, their hopelessness was seated deep into their hearts. From the beginning of the story, their faces were downcast when Jesus said, what are you talking about? Their, their whole posture of their lives was looking, looking down, not looking ahead. It was, it was keeping them from seeing the perspective that, that life was all around them, and all, yet all they saw was the reality of death. Their faces downcast. They speak, we had hoped. Even their, even their statement at the end of the scripture that says he's been in the grave now for three days was deeply significant and revealing about the reality of their hopelessness. For the ancient Jew, they believed that the spirit of a person would hover over a body for a period of three days, waiting to re-enter the body. And after the third day passed, it was when the soul could no longer re-enter the body and was forever in the grips of death. So crossing the threshold of, of three days was deeply significant for the, for the reality of their hopelessness. Because what they had hoped Jesus would be in their life, well, that ship had sailed for them. And hopelessness not only clouded their view of what they hoped that God would have done, but here and now, Jesus was standing face to face with them. He was the, the, all of their hopes and dreams right in front of their faces. And yet, the hopelessness within their hearts clouded their minds from seeing with clarity the truth that Jesus wasn't dead and gone. He was here and now. And I want to start to unpack with you some of the realities that, that I believe hopelessness, uh, how it impacts our hearts, how it impacts our minds and our spirits and the way we think and live today. And the first thing I want to talk about is how I believe, and I've experienced in this in my own life, how hopelessness breeds skepticism. And there's a subtle difference between hopelessness and skepticism, but hopelessness usually always leads us to the place of being a skeptic, where, where that, that, the tone of their response to Jesus, we had hoped, right? And how all of this profound hope built into that Jesus, that God, the Messiah, had come to redeem all of Israel. And that was what they had placed their hope in. But when hopelessness comes in and removes the reason for your hope, all of a sudden, your mind starts to try to explain how things have changed and why. And it can lead us to places of skepticism that make us question whether the things we hoped for were even worth hoping for in the beginning, Check it out. The lie of the enemy convinces us that we are being rational, not skeptical. He, he is a sinister liar that wants to, wants to take you one step further from, from not only convincing you to be a skeptic that the thing you placed your hope in wasn't worth placing your hope in in the first place, but he wants to lead you on a journey of convincing you that you know the best answer. That you, in fact, have within you the ability to explain all of the things that you don't understand and placed your hope in before. So much 
is just built into this expression from the, from the disciples on the road to Emmaus as they're standing before Jesus as they said, we had hoped. The story goes on uh, as they, they explained to Jesus what happened. And they said, we had hoped Jesus had come and he would redeem all of Israel. And then this crazy thing happened. Uh, Mary amazed us with her stories that the, the tomb was empty. It's interesting. In my first glance of the scriptures, uh, I often kind of, kind of like assume that what they're saying is that Mary came and told them an amazing thing. Like there's a hopeful expectation that the tomb was empty, but that's not the case. They go from saying we had hoped to, to saying we were amazed that Mary then came us to these, these fantasies, these made-up stories that Jesus was alive. That word amazed is this word existemi, and it means to be befuddled, to hear something that's ignorant and makes no sense. See, even their posture with Mary, as she came and proclaimed to him, I have seen the Lord. Hopelessness had built barriers of skepticism, the lie of the enemy com com convincing them that they were just being real realistic, and it caused them even to miss the testimony of truth that Mary had seen and witnessed that Jesus was no longer dead, that he was alive. And at the end of our journey today, I wonder if I'm poking in your heart the places where you feel hopeless. And I, I believe hopelessness can show up in so many different areas of our lives. But it brings us to this place where we, we kind of cross this threshold where we, we can't really deal with the emotional weight of the hopelessness that brings in our life. And we, we kind of create a shift in us. We talked about how skepticism is kind of the fruit of hopelessness. But I've, also, I've noticed this in my own life that it's often easier for me and for us uh, to believe something isn't true than to face the reality of our own hopelessness. It's like the full fruit of skepticism. And I see it in, in people's faith journeys all the time. That we get to, we, we feel the grip of hopelessness, skepticism start to grow, we start to convince ourselves from the lie of the enemy that we're just being realistic and all of these things that we hoped God would do that he isn't really doing. Because I feel like God isn't showing up in my life. I feel like God has abandoned me. All I see around me is brokenness, death, and despair. My mind is trying to like orchestrate and figure out why if God promised to love me and care for me, is my life a complete wreck? And hopelessness moves us to this place where we can no longer deal with the pain of hopelessness anymore. So we just believe that something isn't true. And many of us find ourselves crossing, crossing a threshold of faith where we just abandon faith altogether. Because it's easier to say that God isn't real than it is to say, I'm hopeless and how do I deal with that emotion of God not showing up? And... And here's where I want to, can I just ask you for a moment for a little bit of grace? Would that be okay? Like three people said yes. That's good. Okay. I'm a little nervous now, Joel. I called Joel in my office. I said, there's a, there's a point in our, our time together today in the conversation where I think the word gets hard. And here it is. So I just want to prepare you, okay? And, and I'm, not, I'm not calling names today. I just want you to like have that first and foremost in your mind, in your heart, because I'm speaking about my own journey here. Because I think there's an, there's an even um, more dangerous state of mind that comes from hopelessness, which breeds skepticism. But I think it leads us to an even more dangerous place where the enemy ultimately wants to get you to. And I believe the disciples were displaying this reality in that they couldn't see Jesus. And they couldn't, even, they couldn't even make sense of all the promises of God and how it didn't make sense anymore to them. Because to their eyes, Jesus was dead and gone. And they missed the resurrection. But the good news is, after this hard word, I believe we're gonna, God's going to lead us somewhere that will help us open our eyes to see what we oftentimes miss. And that's my heart as a pastor today, is that your eyes would be opened as I pray my eyes continue to be opened so that I might see the things that I didn't see before. Does that make sense? All right, good. <laughs> I'm a little scared now. Here we go. The barrier of hopeless, hopelessness reveals the deeper problem of ignorance in our lives. And ignorance is a, a lack of understanding or a lack of an ability to understand. I want to hone in on what ignorance means today. And, and it, it is shown in the midst of the story. Check it out. Jesus goes on to talk to them after he've had, he's had this whole conversation about what they're talking about, what happened. And then Jesus said this to them, a hard word that I believe he's saying to us today. 
He said, how foolish you are. So, so let it be known, if, if I offended you today, Jesus said it, not me. <laughs> how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What Jesus is saying to the disciples is, you can't see. Because your hopelessness has led you to a place of ignorance. You've gone from hopelessness to skepticism, where you can't deal with the weight of the pain of that hopelessness. And now it has has bore its full fruit in ignorance. Because the soil that skepticism grows in and from is ignorance. And the real danger of ignorance is we've gone this whole journey where we can't bear the weight of the, of, our, of the promises that we feel God has failed upon or, or the brokenness re- and the reality that my life is full of trauma and pain that I don't see God doing anything about. God, where are you? God, what are you going to do? God, how are you going to step up and show up? And I believe we want answers to our trauma bef- and God wants to deal with the problem of the barrier of hopelessness that leads to ignorance in our lives. And ignorance, friends, keeps us from seeing the truth truth, where we become convinced that we know the answer is that God is a failure, the lie of the enemy in our hearts. And ultimately, our pride keeps us from seeing the truth of our own ignorance because we become so locked into our skepticism that, that we, we grow to this place where, where our pride convinces us that we must be right. Not, no, we, not we must be right. We have to be right. And in order for me to be back in relationship with God, you got to answer all my questions, God. And, and they have to line up with the way that I believe things should be. God help us. And what Jesus was talking about as he shared this hard word with those disciples on the road to Emmaus, he said, you foolish people, you don't see from, the, from start to finish of the scriptures that you have been given, you don't understand There is an ignorance in your heart that is keeping you from seeing even what the scriptures mean. Friends, I want to talk to you about one of the the most difficult realities that the church faces today is our inability to understand the point of scripture. And so often we, we take journeys fueled by our own pride that we know the answers and we declare what we believe scripture is is about. Interestingly enough, it often aligns with our own preferences and how we think the world should work. (laughs) Dan, we think that's funny. I think that's hysterical. I do that all the time. Like total permission for you to be honest and genuine. I often read the scriptures and try to understand it based on what I want God to do for me. I often read the scriptures and try to understand it based on how I need God to show up for me. Or to affirm the things that I think are true and right and are wrong about you. Say, come on, Pastor John. Like, oh, goodness sakes. And it's all wrapped up. And Jesus, I believe, was honing in on their ability to even understand the, the revelation that God has given us in the scriptures. And I believe the good news is today that God wants to give us the eyes to see. He wants to help us know what the scriptures are all about. Because the truth is, in the hands of skeptical and ignorant Christians... The Bible becomes several things I want to hone in on today. First, it becomes words on a page instead of the living word. God help us. And when I I open up these pages, the sacred mystery of our faith is that the spirit of the risen Jesus, the word made flesh, inhabits these words. And they they are not just words to be studied or to memorize or to get lots of knowledge about God. Because if all you're doing as you read the scripture is to to know more about God, you are missing the point. It becomes just words on a page instead of the living word. How long has it been since you had an encounter with Jesus, the living word, when you opened up the word? Second one, it becomes a tool of oppression instead of a pathway to liberation. God help us. Ignorance. In the hands of ignorant Christians, the Bible becomes a tool of oppression instead of a pathway to liberation. The living word always is leading people to liberation. Always. Bar none. Never a time when it doesn't. When it leads to oppression and brokenness and trauma, it's because it's in the hands of ignorant Christians who don't understand 
Help us, show us. Lastly, it becomes a collection of fairy tales instead of stories of truth. The very thing that a skeptic would say is wrong with the scriptures, that it never happened. It wasn't real. And ignorance fueled by skepticism, fueled by the deep pain of hopelessness, leads us to this place. So how do we find our way? And I love this about Jesus because Jesus is always the key. Check it out. Here's what Jesus says. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. This is actually from 1 Corinthians. I jumped ahead a little bit. This is, Paul is giving us a little picture of what Jesus is going to show us, that Jesus is the key. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age. It means it didn't come from, from minds of realism who are coming to nothing. The wisdom of the world is nothing. We need a new wisdom, the Apostle Paul says to us. No, we declare God's wisdom Not our wisdom, God's wisdom, which was what? Say it with me. One, two, three. A mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. And none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. For these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. That's very important for our journey towards having resurrected eyeballs and minds, right? He is revealed by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. I love this. The Apostle Paul goes on to say that in order to understand the scriptures on the same thing, we have to have the mind of Christ. That our barrier of of hopelessness is really connected to our inability to have an encounter with Jesus. That changes everything. In the story, Luke 24, we see that Jesus is the key for those disciples on that road to Emmaus. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? The whole purpose of the scriptures that you are missing, that you don't understand... And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, check out what Jesus did. He didn't just tell the disciples, you're ignorant, and leave them be. (laughs) He didn't just say, you don't understand, and walk away. No, because Jesus, like with all the intent of, of, of God in flesh, wants us to understand He wants clarity to be brought to your mind and to mine. And in the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning who? Folks, the most important thing you'll hear from my lips today. That Jesus is the key. And he explained to those disciples that day, and he explains to us today now, that when we encounter the living word, if if we don't allow Jesus to open our eyes to what we have never seen before, we will stay in our places of hopelessness, skepticism, and ignorance. And, and this, a beautiful thing happens when Jesus enters our lives and turns the key, and his, we have an encounter with him where his spirit gives us an ability to understand something that we couldn't understand before him. And friends, that's why we keep coming back to this place that the here and now Jesus is the key to everything for you. And if the Bible is confusing to you, if the Bible has become a tool of oppression and injustice in your life, if, it's, if you're using it to hurt people instead of lead them to liberation, you ought to have a, a clue today that there's some, it, there's some ignorance present in your life and mine. And when Jesus enters in and unlocks our mind with his spirit because we had an encounter with him, all of a sudden the mystery that had been kept hidden for ages is revealed to us. I was on the Google machine this past week and I found this amazing uh, sculpture by this artist who, who I believe is a beautiful metaphor for what happens when we have an encounter with Jesus, where before the scriptures are muddled and confusing and we don't understand what God is doing and who he is. And when Jesus enters in, he repositions our life to see something that we never saw before. Check this little video out, it's amazing. This may look like just a jumble of old painted plastic and wire, but when you take a step back, you see it for what it really is. A remarkable sculpture suspended in mid-air. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? Like, this is the Bible, folks. Not this thing is the Bible, but this is the Bible. And many of us say, where is Jesus? I don't see him. I open the Bible. I don't see him. None of it makes sense. All of my questions are unanswered. Trauma, pain, hopelessness, despair lives in my life. And 
maybe, just maybe today, it's all because you're looking at the scriptures as this jumbled up mess of, of things that don't connect and are confusing. And when Jesus enters in and you have an encounter with him and his spirit invades your life, he unlocks your mind and gives you his mind, which all of a sudden takes the scriptures, just like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he realigns your life. And all of a sudden, we start to see the scriptures reveal something that we never saw before. Friends, if you aren't looking for Jesus in the Bible, you're missing the point of the Bible. I just want to let you sit with that for a minute. Because as a person who grew up in the church, this has changed everything in my life in recent years. I made knowing about the Bible my career. And all of that knowledge, friends, let me tell you, is meaningless without the key that is Jesus. From start to finish, from Genesis to Revelation, where we spend our time looking for how-tos and to-dos and not-to-dos and rights and wrongs, who's out and who's in, who's going to hell, who's going to heaven, we make it about all these things, the scriptures. And I believe Jesus today walks alongside of us face to face. Right here, right now. He's here. And he says, what are, what are you all talking about in your church? And we go, oh man, are you the only, you the only dummy that doesn't know? Like, you got to do this and this to get here. And you got you to look like me actually to kind of make your way to heaven. And, you know, the, the Bible says all kinds of things about how much you should give and what I mean, all, how much you should do and what you should not do. and Like, that's, that's, are you the only dummy who doesn't know that? <laughs> and I believe Jesus looks at us today in the face, and too often we miss him, and he says, you foolish people, let me show you what faith is all about. Let me show you what the scriptures are all about. And he goes, me. Let me show you. And friends, I want to challenge you, go back home today and open your li the living word and read it with new eyes. Look for Jesus in all of it. Look for Jesus. Ask the spirit of God, show me Jesus. Point me to Jesus. Reveal the way to Jesus. Show me the life of Jesus. Show me my life that should be a reflection of Jesus. Reveal to me the image that is, should be inside of me. Show me the spirit of God awakening the mystery of our faith that is God with us here and now. Change my life forever. Friends, we want to get serious about reading the Bible with resurrected eyes here at the point. And we want to help you. We want to be on a journey together. Wonderful opportunities to jump into Rooted, to be in a life group and connect with other people who are reading the Bible. We also have this amazing little app on your phone <laughs> with a thing called the Chronicle. If you didn't hear about it, now you have. It's a great tool where you can go and click on the Chronicle and click on the series that we're in. And each week you can read Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can read a scripture that I'm going to preach about the coming week. And then on Friday, there's a spiritual rhythm exercise and also some questions that help you ask yourself, Jesus, where did you show up in the scriptures this week? And at first it may seem hard because I think we, we like to default, and there's nothing wrong with Bible studies, but we like to default and make the Bible about knowledge, things that we can learn to do, and it is. But if we don't first learn how to have eyes to read the scriptures and find Jesus there, then all this other stuff we do is meaningless. We have to become Jesus people who find Jesus in the scriptures, who have an encounter with him so that the rest of our lives can start to make sense. And my prayer for you this week, friends, is that you will find your way to having an encounter with Jesus, the living word of God. Heavenly Father, I pray now as we worship that you'd help us to have eyes to see you. Forgive us, Lord. Show us the way. Help us to be aware of places of hopelessness. My friends who are feeling hopeless today. My friends who, like me, are feeling a little pricked by this descriptor of ignorance. And maybe, maybe my pride, God, how often it gets in the way trying to convince me that how dare you, God, say that I don't know. 
maybe we need to humble ourselves to this today and say, God, I don't know. And I, I am made aware today, thank God by your spirit, then I need a different way to see you. Jesus, that you might reveal to us the mystery that was kept hidden for ages, but now has been given to us. Thank you, Jesus. Open our eyes today as we worship you. We pray this in your name. faithfulness today. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proved you do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me
sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me yes, Lord thank you for your faithfulness
So Holy Spirit, open our eyes, Lord. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty river, come and fill me again. Let's let that be our prayer now. Come and fill me again. Come and fill us, Lord. Come and fill us again. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, Holy Spirit, Lord, we need you. God, open our eyes, open our hearts. Lord, to see, see you as the center of the scripture, Jesus. Not just a list of boxes to check and things to do, but... Jesus, to see truly an encounter with you through your living word. God, not just fairy tales, Lord, not ways to, to beat people up, Lord, but a way to truly encounter you. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Give us an encounter with you, because Lord, we know one encounter changes everything with you, Jesus. And that's what we're here for. That's what we exist for, Lord, to walk and step with you and your spirit. So as we go today, Lord, we just pray that you meet us where we are and bring us along with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we have uh, these ping pong balls, which is part of our one encounter with Jesus changes everything. If you've had an encounter with Jesus this week, I encourage you to grab one of these ping pong balls that are out in the foyer next to the big one sign, put it in there. Each one of these represents a time when we've encountered Jesus and have been changed in our lives. So as we go from this place, let's go to love and serve the Lord and to walk and step with him and to ask the spirit to give us new eyes to see Jesus today. Amen. Have a great week.